From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Open Line. Welcome to Open Line. Happy Monday to you. We are talking about medical malpractice tonight. It is your chance to call in, ask questions of local attorney Clint Kelly. He's with us again from the Kelly firm. Clint, thank you for being here. Okay, it's good to see you again. Hey, we had a great show a couple of weeks ago, and hopefully some more folks will call in tonight. Maybe it jogged their memory or made them think, gosh, you know, is this something I should have consulted an attorney on? This is what you do for a living, medical malpractice. Right. Kind of give me the rundown of what kind of things you deal with. It is, uh, well, first of all, it's a, it's a major medical mistake that causes a major injury. That's basically the, the, the shorthand answer to what I do. I see cases of all kinds, uh, people who've had bad surgeries, who've been misdiagnosed, uh, some patients who've been given wrong medications. Uh, but generally, I only take a case unless there's been a substantial catastrophic injury or death because juries are, are very conservative, and I think that's what they expect. Uh, before they're going to hold a hospital or doctor liable. And that might surprise some folks because we all think of the McDonald's verdict. You know, and think, oh, juries are just handing out millions right. of dollars. But you're saying that's not the case anymore. It is not. You know, it's uh, the McDonald's case now is about 25 years old. Which, it, <laughs> that's it, it, it hard to a, believe. It, it does. And, and I think uh, nowadays in particular, uh, juries are just very, very conservative about whether or not they're going to award money in, in lawsuits mm -hmm. and so it's a real struggle to win and you have to be careful to take the right case or else the jury will send you home packing. So what does that mean? You got to take the right case. How do you, how do you determine that? Uh, typically my analysis is I look at basically three different things. First of all, I look at is the injury catastrophic? Again, really, really bad. Is someone going to have long-term medical expenses, lost earning capacity like they can't work anymore? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I look at. The next thing I look at is can I prove a definitive cause between the major mistake and the injury? Because if it's fuzzy, that makes it more difficult to prove my case. Sometimes the doctor or hospitals say, well, we, we screwed up, but that's not really what caused your problem, or perhaps uh, the injury was gonna happen no matter what. We call those bad outcomes. Uh, and the third element I look at, obviously, is the conduct itself. How bad is it? Mm -hmm. Is it something that I can portray to the jury as a fairly straightforward and simple situation or is it going to be really complex and and in some cases you know the health care providers conduct is much much worse than it would be in other cases you know particularly if you've got an impaired physician or impaired nurse we'll talk about that later yeah. or uh, where there's just been and I see this quite a bit where there's just from the health care provider standpoint they just don't give the patient enough time and enough care is it more difficult these days because I, I've seen that you know you have some of these doctors who are so narrow in their focus so if somebody goes in for one thing they may have five or six different doctors and then you have a slew of nurses and it's like okay well who is responsible yeah who's uh, who's the captain yeah where, where does the buck stop uh, you'll see that a lot in academic hospitals where there's a mm -hmm. team of physicians uh, and they'll they'll do rounds and there is an attending that's supposed to be the captain but a lot of times you'll have consultants and other types of physicians who will take the patient's care a different direction and you lose sight of what the, the principal problem is that the patient was there for. Um, and I, I find because of the limitations of time that doctors can spend with patients, they in some cases will seize on a particular diagnosis or problem and they just zero in like tunnel vision mm. instead of stepping back and saying, okay, normally you have, you have footprints in the snow that look like horse prints, but what if it's a zebra? They just sometimes they don't back out and look at the big picture, and then by the time they really do, it's too late. Yeah. Where do you start? Somebody calls your office, they call the Kelly firm, and they say, okay, I, I think you guys have something that you should look at. How does it all unfold? Uh, typically, what will happen is that, pa that patient or prospective client will be referred to my paralegal, whose name's Pat. I also have a nurse consultant. Uh, she will look at cases as well, and she will get information from the client about what happened, when it happened. Uh, as much detail as she can get so that I can take a look at it. And then when that information is typed up, it will be emailed to me. I will read it. And I usually get to it within 24 hours of the phone call. Uh, and if I think the case warrants further consideration or review by a medical expert, I will contact the client directly and say, look, I believe your case is worth investigating further. I'll send it to a, a particular doctor that I have. It depends on the specialist involved. And then if that doctor tells me this is a good case, you need to take it, I'll have that client come in, meet with me, and I'll sign the client up. There are also situations where I have the client come in even before I send the case to an expert because there may be a, uh, additional information I need to get directly. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, sometimes I want to size up the client face to face. There's no better way to learn about somebody than actually meet with them face to face. I think, unfortunately, in our day and time, that's not uh, emphasized enough. We do too much electronically. Because that person may end up in front of a jury. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the most important part of your case is, mm -hmm. is the client. How well does your client come across to a jury? And it matters. It does matter. If you're going to invest your time into this case and your resources, because I'm not paying you up front to do this, right? Right, exactly. Then you've got to know there's there's the high likelihood of a favorable outcome so everybody can, can win. Exactly. The client pays nothing unless I recover for the client. And so it's very important to me when I invest thousands of dollars in a case that I make sure that I'm investing in a good case. And it's not just for me. I don't want to put the client or the client's family mm -hmm. uh, through a, a process that's not going to be you know, profitable for them, one that's, that is going to be doomed from the start. And so I have to be very careful in the cases I take, and I have to make sure that this person uh, who I take on as my client is going to have some jury appeal. How long do these cases usually take to play out, whether it's to reach a, a negotiation with the doctor or the company that's responsible, or to go to trial? Typically, it's about 18 months to two years. Uh, what can hold things up, Carrie, is if you have an appeal. Obviously, mm -hmm. that can drag things out a year. Uh, sometimes it has to go a little bit longer because the patient hasn't reached maximum medical improvement, uh, such as a paralysis case. Mm -hmm. But they move pretty, in, in Davis County, they move pretty well. We have a good court system here in this county that uh, I think does a good job in managing cases and getting them disposed of as quickly as possible. Some people might say, God, 18 months, that right. seems like forever. Uh, you can go to California, you can't get a trial date for four years. Really? Yeah. Wow, especially when you're thinking about loss of income and, and just the it's stress that goes along it's with it. It's just devastating. We have a call, and that's what we encourage you to do tonight is call in with your questions. Clint is here to ask them or and to answer them. Joanne is on the line. Joanne, thank you for being part of the show. What's your question tonight? Yes, I would like to talk to Mr. Kelly. Uh, I had talked to him on the Nick Barron show the other day. They were talking about my case. He said that he knew the doctor that I did have a case, but he knew the doctor that I was, anyway, he said he couldn't do it because of conflict of interest. I cannot walk. I cannot walk at all. And I missed my doctor's appointment last month, but I have called lawyer after lawyer. I just want, if he could give me anybody that I can call that could take this case, okay. because I can't walk. Okay, let me put you on hold. Listen to your TV because we're getting some feedback with the phone here. So I don't, I'm not going to hang up on you. Just listen to your TV so you get the rest of this answer. Yeah. Are you familiar with this? I, I am. And she has a, a case that may well be meritorious. Uh, mm -hmm. The, the uh, chiropractor who treated her, uh, I'm, I know the family. Mm -hmm. And under rules of ethics, I'm not permitted to take a case like that. I would certainly uh, would not feel comfortable taking a case like that. The reason we have these rules is... If something happened in the case and she didn't get compensated properly, she might say later on, "Look, you knew you were this with exactly, him. Yeah. or you knew this doctor, and so you went off soft on him." She needs somebody who has absolutely no relationship with the chiropractor to take her case. It was a, she fell down, or sat on a stool, and fell down and injured her back. Oh. But the, the answer to the question, Joanne, is the Nashville Bar Association has a lawyer referral service, and they can refer you to lawyers who'll take a look at the case. There's another unpleasant fact about it, though, which is some lawyers aren't going to take a case like that because they don't think her damages are bad enough. Mm. Um, it's, it, it, our system, as it stands right now, Carrie, is set to compensate certain types of patients with certain types of injuries. And if you're in that middle area where you've got damages but it doesn't seem like a large value case, some lawyers say, I'm just not going to mess with it. And that may be what's happening to Joanne. I don't know. But it's the, so I'm, what do you do? Is there anything that I can do as just a patient who is hurting and who has been affected? She, she needs to call the Nashville Bar Association to see if a, a referral can be made to another lawyer who might take the case. But if no one takes the case, you're out of luck. I mean, what, is, what should she do? Go to the legislature and try to change the laws. Right now, the way our system is, is very yeah. low. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the system we have. Until the law is changed... Uh, people like her are probably going to have difficulty getting representation. And you can't go to like small claims court and say I've had to go to another mm -hmm. doctor and, and here are the medical bills for that? And no, unless in her case she might be able to prove a, what's called a premises liability case in that it may be the stool was defective. Mm -hmm. And you don't need an expert to testify whether or not the stool was defective. Mm -hmm. And I, from her situation I can't tell how much is chiropractic malpractice and how much of it is a bad stool. Mm -hmm. If it's a bad stool she doesn't have to have an expert testify in small claims court, she can sue him that way. 
Uh, but beyond that, there are just some people that are going to have difficulty finding lawyers because the lawyers don't want to spend the money on the yeah. case. Okay. Okay, on that note, we're going to take a quick break. Lots to get to, though. We're going to also let you know how you can check out your doctor or the nurses that you see online before you ever mm -hmm. even show up in the, in the office. So stick around for that, and we're going to get some more phone calls. So stay with us.